Hi. Welcome to our show, For the Love of Animals. We're so glad you joined us today. I'm Darlene Pickford. And I'm Greg Bauer. We want to tell our viewers about a couple of upcoming shows, one on a parallel show to this one with First Aid for Cats, and also one dealing with the ordinances and laws regarding pets in uh, McCracken County and Paducah. Well, we've done part one already today, and we're going to continue our discussion in part two. Our guest today is Lenita Flannery, a local veterinarian here in uh, Paducah. And we've covered a lot of topics in part one, and we'll remind our viewers of that. But let's pick up our discussion. Darlene, what, what, what shall we do next with our well, discussion? Well, we're going to continue with uh, emergency first aid care for okay. dogs. And Lenita, you told us that one of the most common problems that you encounter as a vet uh, is all kinds of poisons. Right. Educate us. Okay, I get lots and lots of calls uh, emergency wise and especially during the day at our clinic too where they think that their pet has gotten into something or they think it's been poisoned. There's lots of different varied signs that they can show that make you think that. Some of them could be just salivating excessively from the mouth, vomiting excessively, diarrhea, um, or they could go into neurological signs where they've got muscle twitching or even convulsions and that can even go into seizures. Um, there's also um, like glazed look in their eyes and sometimes you can even come home and find your animal kind of com comatose. Mm -hmm. And all of those things can be varied depending on what type of toxin it got into. You don't think about it, but your pets are on the ground and they're going to check out everything and they're going to explore by putting things in their mouth or they're going to walk through it and lick their paws or they're going to roll around in the grasses and get things on them. So all of these things uh, that are there to them are very toxic in a lot of ways. We spray fertilizers or Roundup. Roundup seems to be a big problem. Um, there could be um, chemicals like when you clean your floor or bleach. Uh, those are, situ are things inside our homes that animals can get toxic to. Even if you've painted a house recently and you have it locked up and there's no air circulation, the fumes can actually uh, they inhale those and that can actually be a toxin or a poison to them. New carpets. New carpets. Yeah, they can have re uh, reactions to lots of different things. Uh, they can eat mushrooms in the backyard and that's a poison. Mm. I've had a dog that ate a frog. The people saw it and then it went into seizures after that. So that can be a poison as well. Another thing that we commonly hear, and it's true, chocolate. We leave food out or cookies on the counter and the dog comes up and there you go. But chocolate uh, is potentially life-threatening to dogs, not so much with the cats, but with the dogs. And you always have to find out, depending on the size of your pet, how much chocolate is considered can make it just have vomiting or diarrhea or can actually set its heart out of rhythm. Are there any other common things like chocolate that are poisonous or dangerous to dogs that we All need to think? All kinds of things. There's lots of house plants out there and plants out in the yard, azalea bushes, lily bushes, poinsettias during Christmas season. All of these are things that dogs can chew on or cats. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the cam common plants that they have can be poisonous to our pets. Another big thing that we put out is mouse or rat poisoning. Uh, you know, yes. they make it so the mice and the rats like to eat it. It's flavorful, and if a dog or cat finds it, they're going to go for it too. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important poison factor. And, and if you have any pets, I completely discourage you from using any type of rat or mouse poison at all. Because even it can be secondhand, like a cat could consume a mouse and Ooh, be poisoned yes. that way. Yeah. And then we think of food poisonings when we get food poisonings, but dogs are going to go out in the yard and have kind of a different kind of food poisoning. They're going to eat like a little mouse that's laid out in the sun for a day or a little bird that fell out of the nest, and, and that is toxic to them, and so it actually can cause food poisoning for them. Okay. And one of the things, of course, we should never do is feed our pet table scraps. Yes, I'm, I'm a firm <laughs> believer of that not good for them and puts on the pounds, believe me, on, on our pets. <laughs> well, what, what, if we are suspicious of a poison, what do we do? Okay, you need to look in their mouth. If they're, first of all, if they're unconscious, you, you can't do anything as far as make them vomit. If maybe you saw them eat something or, or right, consume okay. something, if you look in the mouth, if you don't see any oral lesions, any sores or something like that, uh, then we want to make them vomit. And that's where our hydrogen peroxide comes in. Now, I can't tell you how much to give. Sometimes it just takes a little bit, and sometimes it takes the whole bottle. But 
force them with the hydrogen peroxide to drink it uh, using your syringes like we talked about in our first aid kit and then moving them around and shaking them and getting them all excited then they usually vomit up whatever that they just consumed. Mm -hmm. and, and would you use a syringe? To, how would you give the... The best way to give the hydrogen peroxide is with the syringe. Okay. And let me also say that you want to get to it as fast as you can. Okay, if they have consumed chocolate or say a rat poison or anything within probably a two hour frame, we try to go ahead and make them vomit. After a two hour frame or if you're uncertain, then you would not want them to vomit. You would want to just go ahead and seek medical attention with the veterinarian. Okay. How much hydrogen peroxide, for example, would you give our guest there, Bitsy? Bitsy probably wouldn't take no more than probably about uh, 10 cc's. Okay. Okay, but you know, a big dog could take a whole bottle of hydrogen peroxide. Okay. And, and you just want to move them, keep them moving, because that causes it to bubble up and here everything comes up. And I guess all in all this, while I'm doing all this, I should get my vet on the phone, yes. right? Yes, if you find, if you, an animal comes up and he's already doing the twitching or having the seizures, you definitely want, you don't want to even worry about making him vomit then. You want to get him to the veterinarian and they're going to take care of the situation there. Okay, and what would I do if my dog is choking? Okay, choking is another very common thing. A lot of times pets are going to eat the little things on, on the floor. Uh -huh. uh, little toys from children are a common thing. Sticks, if they're outside and they're playing, sometimes they'll catch a stick and it can lodge in the back of the throat. Treats, a lot of dogs, they get over anxious and they consume a treat and they swallow it whole and that can start it. But you'll want to open the mouth and extend the tongue. This tongue's going to be slippery, so you might grab a hold of it with a bounty paper towel and pull it out as far as you can. If you can see something, you might take your tweezers and pull it out. Uh, you might take your fingers. If you're afraid the dog might bite, you can actually wrap like a dish towel around your hand and kind of put it in there and try to feel. Uh, see if you feel anything. But be careful not to push something back. Mm -hmm. If you can't see anything and this dog is still choking, and by choking we're going to show signs of like pawing at the mouth, um, they're going to have a blue color to their gums a lot of times, meaning the air is not getting into their system and, and around their body. And another sign is just wheezing or gagging or coughing, trying to bring something up. And if you don't see anything, you'll want to push both hands and push and push. Kind of like the Heimlich remover in people. Okay. A lot of times you can expel it when they cough. Excellent advice. Well, Greg, yeah. shall we take a break and have a happy tale about an animal called Polly Poop? Hi, my name is Polly Poop, and I am a one-year-old beagle mix. Somehow, when I was four or five weeks old and not yet weaned, I wound up on Lanita's doorstep. She took me in, and I've been with her ever since. She lives on a very big farm, and I really enjoy playing there. I like to sleep with the goats, check on the pigs, herd the cats in the barn, hang out with the cows in the pasture, and bring up the horses from the field. I could be anywhere on the farm, and I can really enjoy the freedom. I also love to take exercise walks with Lanita. Thanks, Lanita. I have a wonderful forever home with all my animal friends, thanks to you. Welcome back. We hope the viewers enjoyed that little happy tale about Polly Poo. Before we return to our discussion with uh, Lanita Flannery, uh, we'd like to introduce to you Donna Groves, who is treasurer of Project Hope uh, Humane Society, and she'd like to talk for a few minutes about a capital uh, fundraiser that uh, is going on with Project Hope. Donna? We are trying to raise $150,000 in part of our capital fundraising campaign. We do have a lot of expenses with a no-kill shelter because we keep the animals as long as it takes to find them a forever home. Right. And we get them the veterinary care that they need. I don't know. A lot of shelters don't, don't have no, don't, don't have do any veterinary care. That's right. And we sometimes do heartworm treatments. Uh, you know, all sorts of things that we take feline care of. Feline leukemia testing. Feline leukemia testing, spaying, neutering. Right. Uh, and so we're just asking for donations is part of our campaign. And then the other thing we're doing is, is a paw prints pathway that'll be on display permanently in the shelter. Oh, how neat. For $25, you get a tile in memory of a, of a 
love the loved or, pet. 25 or more. Or more. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Starling. You're welcome. <laughs> Always shortchange our, our campaign yeah. there. Uh, but you can donate $25 or more and get a, a tile in memory of a beloved animal or in honor of one that's still living. Yes. We don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we, if you send me a picture, we can uh, make you a tile in, in, that looks like your pet. Or we can just do uh, paw print, whatever you know. Whatever just, that, yeah. whatever you'd like. Huh? Whatever right. you'd like. And uh, this uh, campaign is also to put a new roof on your. Oh, our roof is in terrible I know, shape. I know you desperately need a new roof because we don't want it leaking on. The animals need a roof over their heads. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. All right, and Donna, where can they send the information and contributions? Well, if you want more information, you can go to www.projecthopeanimalshelter.com, and it has all the information on there. Okay. And if you want to just send a donation or order a tile, uh, it's P.O. Box 125, Metropolis, Illinois, 62960, Project Hope. And if they have any questions, they can call the shelter at right. 618 524 8939. I remember the last four digits. <laughs> <laughs> Donna, we want to thank you uh, for supporting uh, Project Hope and we wish you success. Thank you. And uh, we thank you for coming to give this information to our viewers. Thank you. And Greg, shall we now take another break with a happy tale about our little guest that's here today? A little Bitsy. Bitsy. My name is Bitsy and I'm a four-year-old Pomeranian. I now weigh nine pounds, but it hasn't always been a healthy life for me. When I was four months old, my owners brought me to Lanita because I wouldn't eat and weighed less than one pound. Lanita found out that I have low blood sugar and began to treat me. The treatment was very expensive, and after a while, my owners decided not to continue the treatment for financial reasons. Lenita said that she wanted to keep me, and my old owner said that she could, and I came to have a new home with Lenita. I was really a very sick little girl, but Lenita treated me 24 hours a day, and I gradually got better. Now I go almost everywhere with Lenita. She says that I am spoiled rotten, and the best part is that I know it. Thank you, Lenita, for giving me my special forever home. Welcome back. And we hope that you enjoyed that uh, happy tale about Bitsy, who is our guest today with Lenita Flannery. And we're talking about uh, first aid for dogs. Um, Lenita, as we return to our discussion, what about bite wounds? Bite wounds are very common with our pets. Um, seems like that's probably, I'd have to say, one of the most common emergency calls that I'm going to get is an animal's come in and they've got a bite wound on them. Uh, animals, of course, just like people, they're not always going to get along and they're always going to try to prove who's the boss and they're going to get in a little few scuffles and fights with each other. Uh, whether it's cats or dogs, uh, you're always going to see a lot of bite injuries. Um, bite injuries, a lot of people think, need to be sewed up and we try not to sew up any bite lesions because uh, the animals carry a lot of bacteria in their mouth and then when they bite, they bite with a great force and the canine teeth on dogs and cats are a lot longer than ours so it penetrates deep into the tissues and takes the bacteria with it. So you don't want to sew up a bite wound because it's going to be infectious. You want to okay. leave it open to drain. So at home, we'll commonly suggest if you can to clip the hair in that area, clean it with soap and water, even maybe flush it a little bit with peroxide and then apply the triple antibiotic ointment. But you do need to just not stop there. You know, when you can, you do need to get it to a veterinarian to start on antibiotic treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people make that mistake and they think, oh, it's just a tiny little hole and that's nothing. And then about three or four days later, you'll have a big abscess or your animal will be really sick. Mm -hmm. And so bite wounds are infectious and you do need to start them on antibiotic okay. therapy. We have a lot of snakes in our area. What about a snake bite? Yes. We've had a lot of snake bites this year come into the <laughs> clinic. Um, mm -hmm. Usually in our area, we see copperheads, that's the most common bite, or, or a water moccasin. Uh, however, this year, just here recently, we had a rattlesnake. It actually, they killed the rattlesnake and we saw it, and it was a diamondback that bit a dog. Mm -hmm. If you think your animal got bit, you're, it's gonna be an area that is going to swell profusely in a short amount of time. Okay. Like uh, one lady said that they saw the dog kind of yelp and jump and by the time the dog made it to them, which was only like, you know, 15, 20 yards, it was already starting to swell. And Ooh. that's the immediate type of effect that snake venom has. 
uh, and you're usually going to see two puncture wounds. Uh, okay. A bee sting, a wasping, they are going to swell as well and they're going to cause discomfort and the pets will paw at those areas a lot of times or be licking them, but there's only one usually puncture wound. But a snake bite, there's usually two. Mm -hmm. uh, and that usually it gets dark in color pretty fast around, around where the puncture bite went. Uh, and that at time, you want to keep the animal as calm as you can. You don't want it up running around and scratching at the area and spreading the venom. And if the more nervous and excited they get, then the venom can start to spread more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep them as calm as you can. Sometimes people will try to apply uh, like an ice pack or something to that area. And that's a situation where you need to also get them as fast as you can to the veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of people ask us, we don't have snake antivenom mm. for dogs and cats, so they need just supportive care usually and antibiotic treatment. Okay. And in, in the case with a bee sting or um, a wasp sting, that would be something that our Benadryl would be useful for. Yes, that. very good point. Um, very common that in the summertime our pets are like to even bite at bees and such like that mm -hmm. and they get stung pretty commonly. And those areas, they're going to swell up, they be, be discomfort. Usually you just kind of uh, can put um, a little triple antibiotic ointment on them and give them Benadryl. And, and try to remove that stinger. Yes, if the stinger's <laughs> there, go ahead and try to remove it out. A lot of times animals will lick constantly those areas, so it's pretty, pretty, they'll get the stinger out of themselves with their tongues a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But the Benadryl dose, um, you can, should always, in, when you come into the veterinarian's office, find out what size pet you have and take the most common drugs like Benadryl, Modium AD, or aspirin in. Ask your vet, hey, how much for this size dog? So you'll know at that given moment. Maybe write it down and put it in your first aid kit. Then you won't have any questions later. You'll know. So it's important for you to previously know if it's a real emergency, the weight of your animal or an yes, approximation. Approximation. Right. Okay. Right. Or a lot of times if you, you call the veterinarian and you can say it's a Pomeranian or whatever kind of dog it is and it's normal size or overweight and we can pretty much guess what size is. Right. Well, I'm not a friend of, of particularly of snakes, so if my dog got bit by a snake, I probably couldn't, wouldn't say it was just a snake. I couldn't identify what kind it would be. <laughs> Greg, how about, and Lanita, how about paw injuries? I imagine that's okay. kind of common. That's very common. Pets uh, always get around with their feet, and they have four of them, so they got a greater <laughs> chance of getting them injured. Um, they're running constantly around the farms or on hot pavement and they get, can get burns on the bottom of their feet or they can actually get a cut. A lot of times they'll step on trash and just slice their paw or something. In those situations, uh, they can also get splinters in the bottom and cuckabers. Cuckabers are very common. They get in between the mm -hmm. toes and mm -hmm. they cause discomfort. So I always say if your pet comes up limping on one paw, to be sure to look first at the bottom of that paw and check it out and make sure you don't see anything like a foreign body you can remove. Okay. Okay. And I, I would also imagine that, you know, with our heat that you've this summer had a lot of problems with heat exhaustion. What yes. are the symptoms and then what do we do about it? Well, let me say first off that pets don't have sweat glands like people do. Okay. The only way that they can get heat out of their system is by hassling, which Bitsy's, Bitsy's done a lot of it under these lights, and through their, the bottoms of their pads of their feet, okay? okay? Those are the only two places. So if you found a pet that's been overheated, you need to fan the area and get it in, in cooler uh, in the shade, but you don't want to throw it in the air condition. You have to have a gradual cool down or you'll throw okay. the animal into shock. And a few helpful situations is to try to squirt cool water in the mouth or take cool towels and wet them and lay them over the pet. Keep fanning it. And you can even put rubbing alcohol on the bottom of the pads or if you don't have that, just put cold ice packs on the bottom of the feet. Mm -hmm. Those are ways that can allow the pet to get the heat out of its system. What, what about using, say, a garden hose or something like that? Well, you don't want to just throw it. You might lightly sprinkle it at first, okay. but it's too much shock if an animal does have heat exhaustion just to throw the cold water okay. right onto it. Another big thing is a lot of our dogs, like our bulldogs, our pit bulls, our Boston Terriers, the ones that have the, the short noses, uh -huh. they tend to get uh, swelling in the back of their throat when they get overheated and they'll get a lot of mucus. So you'll want to make sure you clear that out too or they won't be able to breathe good 
and then of course they can't uh, cool themselves down naturally with breathing. Okay. One, one thing that I've gotten from what she just said, Greg, is that you cool them down gradually. Yes. Gradually. You that that, cool that, that down was gradually. not in my memory bank. N not, not the quick. Right. right. And yeah, within an cool. hour or so or you know 30 minutes or so if they're not coming back around and acting like their normal selves then get them get to the veterinarian. Vet. It, al it also says that you need to be sure that your animals if they're outdoors have plenty and plenty of water right. yes. available to them. Yes. Clean fresh water. Yes. Well, I'm going to take a break now, Greg, and I've got another cool topic. We're going to institute something new on our show for our viewers, and mm -hmm. it's called Forget Me Not, and we'll start off with a story about Pepper Sprout, our beloved cat. In 1989, a farmer gave us a wee six-week-old kitten that we all thought was a female. The vet corrected this error and pronounced him as a healthy male cat. From an early age, the kitten seemed to have typical male cat ambitions, and so we named him Pepper Sprout after the old Johnny Cash song. After several years, he became a wonderful lap cat when work permitted us to come home more frequently for lunch. He talked to us all the time. Other new cats came into our home and Pepper Sprout was always accepting of each one, which is somewhat unusual for a cat. His favorite pastime was helping us in the kitchen, and he always wanted to lick the butter dish. He moved with us five times and never complained. In late 2005, he passed away from old age, and our lives have never been quite the same. We will never forget you, Pepper Sprout. The What You Have Just Seen is a new feature of our show called Forget Me Not, and what we're asking our viewers to do is to help us by sending us uh, maybe pictures, a, a little story about uh, your particular pet that you'd like to have remembered, and that we can feature that on the show. And the only re thing that we ask is that you then make a contribution in whatever amount you would like to your favorite animal welfare organization. And uh, that was the only requirement that you have, and we'll be happy to feature your pet. In, and, in, and if they will send yes. the contribution, the check, to, uh, to the address we've given you, then we will forward it to that animal organization. And we're going to start this out by sending a, a donation to In His Hands Humane Society. They're a spay-neuter group out of Crane, Kentucky. And this is in memory of our deceased cat Pepper, Pepper Sprout, Sprout mm -hmm. that we had from 1989 to 2005. The contributions can be sent to Forget Me Not, 3734 Buyer Lane, Paducah 42001. Or if you have questions or would like to have your pet uh, featured on this particular segment, you can call at 270-443-8330. And we invite your participation. The animal welfare organizations will really appreciate it also. And it can be the it's your choice of the amount of money and your choice of the animal welfare organization. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, Greg, we have another amazing contribution also to our uh, show. We have a, pa a poem today by Pam Wells, and it's The Miracle of Love. A miracle of love, caring hands reach out to stroke the injured shepherd's head whispering gentle words to calm, easy boy, he said. Familiar arms lift up the dog as he struggles in the rain. With pleading eyes, Max whimpers low for help to ease his pain. As he puts Max on the sheltered porch, he bows his head in prayer. Lord, guide my hands and bless our dog and keep him in your care. Help me, please, to heal our Max with strength and skill from you knowing he's such a special friend, so loyal and so true. Later, the family rallies round Big Max, who looks so sad and frail. Then one by one, they start to hope as he tries to wag his tail. Then the pinkest tongue sneaks out to touch his master's healing hands. Very slowly and with growing strength, his trembling body stands. It's a miracle of love to help save and to mend the greatest gift that we can give to aid our helpless friend. 
We'd like to thank Pam for this wonderful poem uh, on the miracle of love. Returning to our discussion, uh, Lenita, what about eye injuries? Eye injuries are pretty common. Um, our pets are running outside all the time and they can get little seeds, they can get little tiny pieces of grass. Because pets are hairy, commonly a lot of times the hairs will get in the eyes and cause an irritation. Uh, so those are simple kinds of things to be looking for, but you'll notice that your pet will be rubbing its eye or with its paw or maybe up and down on the carpet. The eye might be red or swollen or you might notice some abnormal discharge. In those situations, the best thing to do is flush it thoroughly when you first notice it. And that's when, with your first aid kit, you'll have your eye flush or mm -hmm. your visine, if nothing else. But flush it really thorough and make sure that hopefully you would get a hair or seed or something irritating like that out of the eye. And then you can apply that triple antibiotic ointment. A lot of people think that's just for a skin wound, but triple antibiotic ointment can be used in the eyes as well. It's a good okay. uh, antibiotic treatment. If you do notice any signs of cloudiness on the eye or what looks like a bloody hemorrhage though, those immediately need to be seen by the veterinarian. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, where could we go, uh, Lanita, for more information or summary information about first aid for our animals? There's lots of different types of references out there. I know on our website at the clinic, it's www.flannerivet.com. We have a, a red cross signal that says 911 on it. Pet 911. Pet 911, and that's for pet emergencies, and you can always click on that. It's got a lot of good information about first aid for your pet at home. But be sure, most importantly, to know your veterinarian's telephone number, because <laughs> they are your link to taking care of your pet the best. Yeah, and an additional reference is this DVD on pet uh, first aid, and this is from Apergee uh, Entertainment, and you can contact them at 1-800-210-5700. Of course, I think our show part one and part two is just as good, but if you'd like to order a DVD for yourself or your friends, this is a good source. So, Lanita, uh, we want, what final thoughts would you like to leave with our viewers? The main thing is just I want to tell everyone to take care of their pets and supervise them like children. Remove all their harms and temptations that you can out of their reach just like you would a child. Because really and truly the old saying is right, an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. Absolutely. Well, we certainly do thank you for all this yes. wonderful information and for doing part one and part two with us. You and Bitsy have just been remarkable <laughs> guests, and we're just so glad that you volunteered your time uh, for the love of animals. Thank you. And, and to conclude, I'm Greg Bauer. I'm Darlene Pigford. And asking our viewers to remember, give your pet a little extra love today and, and every day. day. See you next time. Bye. Thank you.